Welcome to the channel folks. Yesterday I released a video in my series of movies we will never get to see, where I detail scripts and script treatments for projects that, sadly, will for one reason or another, just simply never happen. Yesterday was the Panos Cosmatos Hellraiser script treatment. Panos Cosmatos has released two movies so far, Over the Black Rainbow, which, opinion-wise, isn't the best, and of course Mandy, which was a pretty big hit with the film festival audiences as well as your normal indie movie watcher as well. Mandy is a film which I personally liked. So when I had the chance to get a hold of the script treatment for Hellraiser from the same man behind that, I thought this could be something great, especially having seen the Cenobite-esque biker gang in Mandy. And I also assumed that this would be something you guys would absolutely love to sink your teeth into, hence releasing it. Unfortunately, I wrongly assumed that this was work for hire, which would have meant the copyright didn't actually lie with Panos and his management team. Sadly, that was incorrect, and even though it is somewhat a grey area, I had several emails with demands to remove the video. So the video is gone. Removed. However, what I have done today, and something that does not breach anyone's copyright at all, is compiled a summary version of the script treatment for your pleasure and the ideas that I personally enjoyed, plus my commentary and personal critique on the script. It is as fair use as you could possibly get. Unfortunately, I will say this, the interaction has left me rather lacking in respect for the director and his team. This is work that will never be produced, ever. Anyone with any sense about them knows this, by and large due to the fact of the expense involved in such a grand project and the unmarketability of the Hellraiser franchise. So, to let the public hear these ideas, especially those in the horror fandom, is actually an incredibly good idea as it builds good buzz and word of mouth for future projects of that director. So, to stifle those ideas from the public, ultimately, I'm sure you will agree, only hurts that brand. So, that out of the way, let's discuss the Hellbound Heart adaptation from Panos Cosmatos. The script treatment itself opened in the past, which is a fairly generic opening to films, however one which does make sense for scene setting here. We open in the 70s to our main antagonist, Franklin Gregorius. Stated in the script to be a legend among the architectural world and a land developer, but also, as we learn, a sadist and a deviant. A man whose dark desires ultimately ruin his life. He has got his hands on a lament configuration, which his wife finds one day in his study. His innocent wife, an important characterization as we find out later. Upon finding the box, drawn to its power and calling, she solves it near instantly. And we see that all too iconic glow, the walls crack, they open, the very fabric of our dimension is torn asunder, and from the light comes the dark shadowy figures, presenting dark pleasures and desires beyond our fragile mind's comprehension. Pinhead is there, and he states how her innocence is a rarefied spirit, one that he will enjoy ripping apart over and over again in the bowels of hell. The opening of this screenplay closes with Franklin entering his study, seeing only blue electric emanating from the box and his wife vanished forever, gone, lost to the depths of hell. For the purpose of fair use and commentary and critique, as an opening, it is definitely cliché and it is something that has been done all too many times before. It's unlikely to have grabbed the audiences who are familiar with Hellraiser, as all I could personally picture as a long-time Hellraiser fan is something actually akin to the opening of the fourth movie. However, I do like the ideas that are established here. An architect. It's something which comes into play later down the line. And I do like the fact that this man just has the box, because, of course, the explanation as to how he acquires the box, generally speaking, is needless exposition. Although, the incredibly iconic, what is your pleasure, could have been a nice nudge-nudge, wink-wink moment. And also, if you're looking to establish a future franchise, it's a nudge-nudge, wink-wink moment, which could have just set that up nicely. 
As per the screenplay, we open with something essentially identical to Mandy. The setting alone is pretty much the same. We see a dark and expansive forest with mist masking its hidden secrets. We see mountains, we see the sky, a dark grey. And in the distance, we see a giant structure, the Everest of buildings, something unholy and unnatural about its looming presence. This, we learn, is something designed by none other than Franklin Gregorius, of course. And we see our main characters, Lisa and her father. To summarise the characters, they fall under incredibly generic and again, quite paint by numbers. Again, I'm sure you'll agree, it's not just me riffing on them. The single dad and child. The mother had died not too long ago and they were now moving somewhere of their dreams. Well, the father's dreams because he is a designer and an architect himself. Interestingly enough, the character of Lisa is described as bright, pretty and shy. Something that we have seen before in Hellraiser movies, something very much exactly the same as our first main character, Kirsty. It's also something which is incredibly common in horror movies in general. It's the characterization of a young protagonist. I did find myself asking, who is this character written for? But like I said, that's neither here nor there. The characters are en route to the building, they're moving in. We learn that there is a process of application, which is not something just anyone can do. You must pass this application process to gain residency within this building. And we later learn that actually this building is in fact sort of a hyper configuration, a giant, massive lament configuration. One that acts like a magnifying glass for the small box. The entire building itself, it moves, it unlocks, it changes and it becomes more. Each room is designed in a way with a type of patron in mind, hence the vetting process, but that idea isn't really expanded upon. It's an interesting idea, however I will say that it seems like it was taken from the fourth movie with respect to the buildings being lament configurations and also the giant space station, so it's hardly an original idea. But I do like the idea that a building could move, ebb and flow around you. Sadly though in the script it actually isn't used to that effect, or should I say not nearly to that effect. Which from a personal standpoint I feel is an absolutely wasted opportunity to create something a little more unique. As the father and daughter move into the building, they learn that the mysterious designer and architect hasn't been seen or heard of from in years, though we find out that he's actually living upstairs all along. Again, it's quite a cliche narrative, but it's something that I didn't actually roll my eyes at too much. From here, there is a young love that blooms, which is important to the narrative as Lisa explores the building, falling in love. The young pair then stumble along and they find their way to the penthouse where Franklin Gregorius is, which is when we enter into our third and final act. Realistically, the second act and pretty much the middle of the third act is kind of padding. Now this is where the Cenobites are called in the third act, of course. Before that, we really don't see much of them, which I don't mind too much. It's quite in line with the original film. However, when the Cenobites are called, Pinhead is there, and he is called the Black Pope, which personally is something which I really, really did like. I absolutely love that term, and it's one of the more interesting ideas to come from this script, undoubtedly. So the Black Pope is summoned, he takes the young lovers to hell, taking a moment to taunt Franklin about his wife, and he's gone. The lovers are in hell, tied together, bound, and they're hung in the centre of a communal area for Cenobites. Now there are a few other points to bring up here. Franklin had a benefactor, someone who funded his more outlandish projects, the Lament Configuration Building being one of them, but this is just not explained. However, I would assume that it is something related directly to hell, Probably someone similar to a Lament Configuration Guardian. It is explained, however, where Franklin acquired the Lament Configuration later down the line, and it's actually a riff on the original where Frank Cotton got the, uh, the box in the Far East. All in all, reading it, it actually reads better than it does when you start to dissect the ideas and really take the time to pull it all apart. For a Hellraiser movie, it could have been a good intro to the world for fans and for general audiences. It wouldn't, however, have been groundbreaking in my eyes. It was a very Hellraiser though, very much in line with Clive Barker's original style of writing, but sadly, doubtful that it would have been profitable. So there you go, a rough outline and summary of The Hellbound Heart by Panos Cosmatos. Unfortunately, like I said at the start, the interaction has left me with a distinct lack of respect for the man's work now. 
I appreciate that leaking things like this can genuinely hurt projects, but like I said, this is a film that simply will not be made, ever. However, I would assume that the damage control that has come out from this is actually because of the recycling of ideas, and the fact that if people realise that some of these ideas have been recycled into other works, i.e. the opening of Mandy, and also the Cenobite Bikers, Mandy, the, uh, the Lover Gone, Mandy, then people would just lose interest in future projects. But look, that's just my personal opinion and what I could garner from the script and the interaction. Anyway, I would love to hear your thoughts on this and obviously apologies for the double upload, but I hope you can understand why I want the ideas out there, but I also don't want to be sued, Panos Cosmatos and legal team. All the best and thank you so much for watching this video. As always, guys, I have been Mr. H. Take care.